Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever and ever. Today we celebrate the feast of the holy great martyr Saint Barbara and our holy father Saint John of Damascus. So we will start with the great doxology in a few moments. Um, regarding the uh, Lord have mercies at the litany of peace, we will use the formal ascending and descending Kyries. And at the grand so lords, we will use the uh, alternate formal setting, the ascending and descending setting for that as well. And other than that, it should be a, a fairly standard um, uh, fourth class festival divine liturgy. Christ is among us. He is in every <coughs> Glory to you, who show forth the light. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth and good will among men. We pray to you, we bless you, we worship you, we glorify you. From age to age, 
of your mind be enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches and glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what gives greatness of his power towards us who will be. In measure of his wisdom, its measure is the working of his mighty power, which he has wrought in Christ by raising him from the dead, and setting him at his right hand in heaven, above every principality and power, and virtue and domination, in short, above every name that is made, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and all things he made subject under his feet, and he gave him his head over all the church, which is indeed his body, the fulfillment of the one who fills all with all. Peace be to Spirit. Christ is among us. It wasn't too long ago that we heard the readings at Vespers for the feast of the entrance of the Mother of God into the temple. And at those readings we hear about the overshadowing of the tabernacle, <clears throat> then Solomon's temple, and then finally the temple of Ezekiel, 
the visionary temple of the future, we see them overshadowed by the glory of God and people being unable to serve within that temple because the glory is so powerful that it's incompatible with mortal life. Um, or as the prophet Ezekiel does, he casts himself down prostrate before this manifestation of glory. It is such a realization and understanding and awareness of the glory of God that, apostle, that the Apostle Paul prays for the Ephesians. He says he wants them to know that the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, is with them and in them, and that he has begun this work of transfiguring them. He prays that we would receive the spirit of revelation so that we might see and understand the depth and the height and the glory of the vocation which we have received, the vocation we have received as the baptized. A power that is already at work in us because we have been baptized. The power that raised Jesus from the dead and lifted him above all powers and principalities and dominations and seated him at the right hand of the Father so that he is glorious above all, both in this world and in the next. And it's such a vision of glory, the glory of Christ, the Christ into whom we've been baptized, that the Apostle wants us to have. I was talking over the Thanksgiving break with one of my sons. We were talking about uh, Marvel movies, and um, I think he's seen all of them. There's a few I haven't seen. But one of the things that we, start, we were talking about was the, um, the way in which these, um, these stories, these mythologies, whether it's the Marvel movies or Star Wars or Star Trek or whether it's uh, Disney princesses in the case of his um, daughters, how they shape our imagination. And there's two problems with it. One, they sometimes present us with mysteries of such majesty that they compete with some of the records of Scripture. So when Yoda dies and is sublimated into the Force, or Obi-Wan, or others, we're given an image of grave clothes still where the place of the place where the person was laid or died. Um, and so we're given an image of the resurrection of the body. Um, Doctor Strange, you have, um, you have a mortal combating the power of destruction and um, reversing time um, and, and doing something of, of cosmic significance. You have all of these images given to our imagination and made realistic in the way that they can be made realistic by CGI. And yet, there's a sense in which it ends up trivializing those things for us. That having seen with our physical eyes the unimaginable, the marvelous, we become used to it. And it ceases to be the marvel that it was. At the same time, almost all of those stories, I can't think of one right now, where the end of the story isn't um, a saving of this world, of a salvation that is imminent within the same horizon with which we started the movie, the horizon of this life, of this world, this mortal world as it's going on. We're not given to believe that these marvels can deeply transfigure the nation, the nature of reality itself in the way that Christ has done it, in the way that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father for this world and for the world to come. For the right kind of vision, we need the Holy Spirit to come within us and fill us with that awareness.
For this, Paul prays. And in a certain way, this is what the Lord exhorts us to in the gospel. He's just been talking about how we don't need to worry about what we're going to eat and what we're going to wear with the concerns and the, the, the worries of this present world that we're supposed to have faith in him. Do not be afraid any longer, little flock, for your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Paul wants us to understand how rich and great a gift that is. And if we see it, what will we do? We will sell our belongings and give alms. We will give everything that we have, our substance and our lives, so that we transfer all our inner wealth um, to that kingdom and that we keep nothing for ourselves here in this world, that we serve and watch for that revelation before our physical eyes of that glory to which the Spirit has been instructing us internally. And we stake our whole lives on that. It's very hard, I think, for those of us who are living in the world and called to continue to live in the world. And that would be um, any of us <clears throat> who doesn't have a monastic vocation or isn't called to martyrdom. We have the examples of the holy and great martyr Barbara and our venerable father John of Damascus who, a martyr on one hand, and a monk, a monastic, a venerable monastic on the other, who give us examples of those who literally and completely fulfill what the Lord is suggesting to us and begging of us in the gospel. And we could get involved in a kind of casuistry as we try to figure out what is an appropriate level of concern about life in this world. You know, how much should a young, um, a young man setting out and, and um, uh, wooing a woman and preparing to marry, and then when the children come along, and then the, there's the career and the, the money that one needs to send them to a decent school, and all of those things which can preoccupy us and to a certain degree ought to insofar as we are in this world. And we do have duties of charity toward those who have been entrusted to our care. Or as pastors concerned about the well-being of our churches and making sure the bills are paid and the lights are kept on and the heat and that someone is maintaining the roof and so on, we can get caught up in these worldly concerns for the worldly dimension of the church. And even when you get old, like me, you still have to worry about your grandkids. So insofar as we are embedded in this world, we will run the risk of being pre preoccupied with them to a degree that could eclipse, that could eclipse the vision of the great gift we have been given, the kingdom which has already been given to us in our baptism. I do not think that it's helpful, generally, to try to engage in a casuistic analysis of our situation. Well, how much should I love my grandkids? Or how much should I do this? How much I... I think that Paul's solution as it's given in the epistle to the Ephesians is the correct one. Let us pray along with him that we be given the spirit of revelation and knowledge, that we may know more and more deeply the glory of the Father who has revealed himself in Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus has bestowed upon us an eternal kingdom. Christ is among us. He is in all ways. Let us all say, let us all say, let us all say.
Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord God, our fathers, we pray to you, hear us and have mercy. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. Yara Bodham, Yara Bodham, Yara Bodham. May we pray for our Father in the Shabbos and for His honorable presence. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. May we pray for the priests and the deacons, the monks, the nuns, and for all our brothers and sisters in Christ. Kyrie Eleison, Kyrie Eleison, Kyrie Eleison. Yara Bodham, Yara Bodham, Yara Bodham. May we pray for the blessed and ever to be remembered founders of this holy church, and for our Orthodox fathers and brethren who here or elsewhere lie sleeping in the Lord. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And we pray for those who bear offerings, those who do good works in this holy and most venerable church, for those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present. Oh, 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 oh,
us all in his kingdom at all times, now and always, and forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord God remember in his kingdom. Our blessed patriarch, Joseph. Our God-loving bishop, Nicholas. The entire priestly diaconal monastic order. Our government and all in the service of our country, the ever-memorable founders and benefactors of this holy church, the soul of the departed servant Mary Lee. May the Lord God remember us all in his kingdom, always, now, and ever, and forever. Amen. The King of Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets, 
and in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I profess one baptism for the remission of sins, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us stand well, let us stand in awe, let us be attentive to offer the holy oblation in peace. Mercy and peace, the sacrifice of grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And with your spirit.
he made firm my steps, the just man shall be remembered forever and every he shall not fear. deliberate and the indeliberate, those committed in word and in deed, whether knowingly or inadvertently, and count me worthy to share without condemnation your spotless mysteries for the remission of sins and for eternal life. Amen. Receive me now, O Son of God, as a participant in your mystical supper, for I will not reveal your mystery to your enemies, nor give you a kiss like Judas, but like the thief I confess you. Remember me, Lord, in your kingdom. May the reception of your holy mysteries, Lord, be for me not to judgment or condemnation, but to the healing of my soul and body.
your inheritance, safeguard the fullness of your church, sanctify those who love the beauty of your house, in return raise them to glory by your divine power, and do not forsake us who put our hope in you. Give peace to your world, to your churches, to your priests, to the government, and to the armed forces, and to all your people, for every good gift and every perfect grace is from above, coming down from you the Father of lights, and to you we render glory, thanksgiving, and worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and always, and forever and ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 